Hey, life science. Uh, golly, you guys, I miss you guys so much. I hope you're doing good. Um, I hope you guys are able, you know, get outside a little bit, go for a run, walk the dog, go for a bike ride, do something. Uh, so they're not just all cooped up inside. Uh, because trust me, being inside this classroom all day without you guys, um, it's not so fun. I miss you. Um, I miss seeing your faces. I miss just going back and forth, talking with you guys. Um, so, hey, I just wanted to make this video. I was thinking about posting this as pictures, but I thought, you know what? No, let's make a video. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through the answers for uh, 12E. I'm also going to be going through the answers for 12F because uh, both of those things were due. And... Um, uh, I want to let you guys know that we're going to have a Zoom meeting next week. Um, I'm going to figure out the day for that. Uh, I'm kind of leaning towards maybe Tuesday. Um, that's kind of what I'm thinking. So um, if we could do that, what I would like that to look like is you guys make sure that you have your uh, accounts through Zoom. And um, we'll do a Zoom meeting. I'll put all the info up on Google Classroom so you can check that out. You'll see the time, the link, all that information, whatever the password may be, just to get in. And um, by that point, we, we'll be done with the chapter. And so I want you guys to be able to ask any question throughout the whole chapter. I can talk you through a little bit more on uh, 12E and 12F because basically it's been without class going through those two sections. And so... Um, I want to really make sure you understand, like keeping up with your reading and rereading, um, taking notes after you read. If you have questions, emailing me those questions. Um, it's going to be vital, all right? Kind of really taking ownership of the chapter. And then I'm going to be doing a little bit more when it comes to Zoom meetings once we start a new chapter so that we can talk through the lessons together. Um, we'll still do the normal when it comes to working from the book. And, um, you know, making sure you guys are taking notes, you're keeping up with your reading, uh, all the normal stuff that we do leading up to a test, we're still going to do that. So I'm going to make sure that you guys are doing key terms and review questions. You'll see that posted uh, on Google Classroom as well. Uh, you can get a little taste of some of my algebra videos. I got a whole mess of stuff going on back here. Just finished filming some of those. So anyway, let's get down to it. Um, the 12 is already graded, 12F I'm going to grade right after this, uh, but you guys have already turned it in. So here we go for the first question on 12E, name a mollusk that is edible. A lot of you guys had clams. We could say octopus, oyster, scallops, squid, snails. There's a lot of different things here. Uh, number two, what function do an octopus's suction dis serve? Basically, it's capturing prey, it's grasping prey, it's uh, holding on or attaching to different structures. They help in movement. Something this answer doesn't cover, and I would have given it to you in a lecture, is I wanted you to know that every one of those suction cups, um, because by the way, the, uh, the nervous system of cephalopods with, you know, that's squid and octopus, it's really intricate, and it is so amazing. Every single one of those suction cups actually has a direct connection to the nervous system, meaning not only do they know that there's touch there, but they can actually taste and even slightly smell through the suction cups. So imagine that that would mean that an octopus can put each tentacle in a different location when they are probing and hunting for something, and every single one of those tentacles through that suction cup is actually able to determine if there's something edible in there. So that's amazing. They're, they're truly given that as a gift. God has really put them in a totally different category, all their own. Um, and then other things, you know, that I would have probably told you about is that, uh, you know, these octopus and, and some squid, I mean, they even have like a venom that they can inject when they use their beak because that is their version of a mouth. It's like a beak. It's very, very sharp. Think of the beak of a falcon or a hawk, and that's what an octopus is able to work with. That, along with those suction cups that can basically taste or smell, they are truly gifted when it comes to being able to hunt or, for that matter, 
know where not to be. If they know that there is a predator around the corner, the suction cups are able to help them with that too. So listen, extra stuff I'll give you. Uh, let's keep moving on here. Number three, it's a true or false. Octopus reproduce asexually by regeneration, and that's going to be definitely false. So octopus clearly are going to have um, uh, regeneration as far as like losing a limb, but not through reproduction. Okay, so we're talking still dealing with um, sexual reproduction. Uh, number four, what does an octopus use its siphon to do? Now, the textbook predominantly says it uses its siphon for movement. It's going to force water out so it can move away really quickly. But something else I would have let you guys know is that it can put the ink, it could shoot the ink out of the siphon. Also, the siphon is where eggs are going to be released. Um, and it's like kind of that multi-purpose organ within the, uh, the whole grouping of cephalopods. And so... Yes, predominantly used for movement, but there's a whole other thing. They can use it for a lot of other options. Okay, so just wanted to make sure you understood that. Um, all right, number five here, what part of the clam's body manufactures its hard shell? We're really just looking for the mantle. Okay, so I know that some of us went into a little bit more descriptions here, that outer layer, but really it's the mantle. And so if you, again, I want to kind of relate this back because it's easy to think shell on a clam or an oyster but if you actually know a little bit about the mantle it's still in the octopus especially the squid not really the octopus as much but the squid um, through a dissection you can take out what's called the pen and that pen is like this crusted layer that's created by the mantle and so that's like their little shield because they have no bones they're very very soft bodied but they do need a little bit of protection in there. So just wanted you to know that extra bit too. Um, something else, number six, all right, clams are, and then we had a multiple choice one, it's B, filter feeders. So clams are just allowing water to come in. And again, through that filter feeding, they're just extracting out what they want from the ocean water. Okay, so if they allow something to come in, they can filter out what they don't want, keep what they do want, and that's just a simple process that allows them to keep eating or also keep moisture in. So you'll notice mussels are able to live a little bit longer outside of the water than a clam. Um, so mussels hold in water and really lock it in tight a lot better than a clam would, but a clam's a lot more mobile than a mussel's gonna be. All right, taking a look at number seven, two echinoderms besides the starfish there's a lot of things you could say here sea urchin sand dollar sea cucumber um and something i don't know if you guys remember i think i showed you this video sea cucumbers they got a special tactic they use to scare away predators or something really trying to hurt it they can literally expel their intestines meaning essentially they are spitting out their intestines and they can regrow complete intestines with really just in a matter of days and that's amazing and it's one of those things that again God has given them these crazy methods that they're able to use who would think you can actually expel your intestines it doesn't kill you it saves you and then you just regrow some new ones amazing amazing stuff all right um, let's take a look at number eight Starfish has radial symmetry, so that's a circular shape. Starfish has it. Cutting it down at any angle is going to give you perfect symmetry on each side. Uh, number nine, what is the function of the hard plates and spines in starfish? Support and protection. So support for keeping everything where it should be. A lot of it, though, is protection. And the last one here, number 10, where are starfish's tube feet located? It's on the bottom. Okay, they say the bottom of each ray. So it's kind of like each little finger going out. It's on the bottom. All right, uh, let's take a look at 12F. We'll go through some of those answers. Talk you through a little bit here. Um, okay, number one, arthropods have, and it's a multiple choice question here, and it should be letter D, which goes for A and C. So A is jointed appendages. And C is an exoskeleton. Exoskeleton kind of is obvious, right? That's that protective outer shell. It's like think of a, a knight going into battle and they have to have that armor on to protect themselves. 
that is the version for all insects. They don't have any internal bones to protect them, so they gotta have an external skeleton. And jointed appendages, I think we talked about this too. So in other words, just for them to move, like we're talking our elbow for an insect would be a jointed appendage. They can't have that exoskeleton go all the way over their elbow. There has to be a slight opening right there so that they can move it. And that would be the same thing for, if you're thinking about a knee or whatever you're talking about, for an insect to fully move, they gotta have a jointed appendage right there. So that's two different parts connected. All right, let's take a look at number two. What are the three main parts in an insect's body? We have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. It may seem like it's slightly out of order, but the abdomen does go last, okay? Number three, true or false, insects have compound eyes. That is very, very true. If you've ever seen what it looks like, if you were the insect looking, you should look up a YouTube video on that, just how unbelievable. Compound eyes, it's like they're able to see so much around them, and then they can choose to focus it all in on one area, but that's why, for weirdly, here's an example, you ever trying to like catch a fly and you literally are moving from behind it, it seems like it shouldn't see you, their compound eyes are pulling in all different refractions of light, and the second there's a bit of a shadow going over them, that refraction of light changing, they know that something's wrong. So they move. So it's almost like they're able to see completely around it because those light refractions all go in through the compound eye and gives them a little bit more through their sensory organ. Okay, let's take a look at number four. Which part of an insect's body functions in respiration? That would be C. That's the trachea uh, or... Yeah, tra so we have our own version, right? We have our trache, trachea. Um, so that's through breathing, where the esophagus, that's gonna be more through eating, going down. Uh, let's take a look at number five. What does the word metamorphosis mean? So this is a word that can be used a lot of different ways, but essentially it's changing, all right? A change in body form, it's a change. Uh, could be, you know, from like caterpillar, totally looking different as a moth or a butterfly. Um, and so a metamorphosis is a full change, all right? You can have what's called complete metamorphosis, which is a great example of like something going from an egg to a nymph, then you can maybe get into that caterpillar, then butterfly. Every stage is very different in complete metamorphosis. Gradual metamorphosis would be a lot like a, um, a grasshopper, cricket, something like that, where when they're born, essentially, they actually look just like an adult, they're just very small. So they gradually grow, but they do not really go through these massive changes like complete metamorphosis would do. So that's a little extra. Okay, taking a look at number, uh, let's see, number six. All right, insects going through the developing stages of incomplete metamorphosis are called nymphs. And number seven, List the four stages of complete metamorphosis. So this is what I was talking about here. So you go from egg to larva to pupa to adult. And so each of those stages look distinctively different from the prior stage, okay? All right, number eight. Uh, what can we learn from an ant's behavior? Well, I'll tell you, ants are just insanely good at their jobs, working in these colonies that are thousands and thousands, if not even close to like a million ants, and yet they all have a distinguishing purpose within that group, and they do very well at it. So the ants we're looking for, basically developing good work ethics, uh, accomplishing tasks that are given to you, um, God giving you a role, and you knowing that role, and you going through life and really accomplishing that role. And it's not really just for your own benefit, but for the benefit of God's kingdom. So weirdly enough, I mean, you might think, wow, he's extrapolating too much from an ant, but you could really go there. You can think if you're given a task and a role, God is giving you all something amazing in your life. And eventually you're gonna find that. You're gonna know like, this is what I'm put here to do. Guys, I love teaching you. So I gotta do that to the best of my abilities. And so this is a given task. You're going to figure that out someday. And I know, again, Mr. A, okay, get off your soapbox, but this is kind of a cool question. You can really pull a lot from just something so small as an ant, but there's a lot to learn there. All right, okay, let's move on. 
Number nine. Uh, let's see. What are two ways in which an arthropod's exoskeleton is similar to a knight's armor? Did I not already talk about this? I didn't even know. That was one of the questions they're going to ask you. Uh, so the armor, it could restrict movement. We talked a little bit about that, where if you got armor going over a jointed appendage, that's not good. But it's also going to help protect it. And something special here is that they will get a brand new quote unquote set of armor. So insects go through this process of molting so that exoskeleton doesn't grow with them. They will outgrow it. And so they molt it off and gross enough, a lot of insects eat that molt and then they gain nourishment back from it. So I used to actually have um, a crawfish, you know, a crayfish, depending on how you want to say it. And so they will molt and they will eat that exoskeleton. I always remember as it was growing, it would molt and it would literally look like there was two in the same cage. And the next thing you know, it's gone. It eats it up. It gains all the nourishment from it. Um, centipedes, they do the same thing. Again, another YouTube video you could look up is a centipede molting and then eating that molt. All right, uh, next thing, let's take a look at 10. Last one here. List three arthropods other than insects. We got a lot. We could have a crab, crayfish, like I said, a lobster, a barnacle, a shrimp. Uh, pill bugs, centipedes, millipedes, scorpion, ticks, mites, spiders. There's a lot that you could go for here. Um, you know that whole ticks and mites and spiders? Uh, arachnids, that whole category of arachnids, I'm not a big fan of. Um, I know, I think I've told you guys this story. I'll end with this. So I went to one of those big reptile shows with my son. This probably goes back when he was, I don't know, maybe five or six, so probably at least two and a half, three years ago at least, and uh, they had what's called a bird-eating spider. And no joke, we're talking this big, that's a big tarantula, bird-eating, and so my son wants to hold it. And I'm not a huge fan of this, but you don't want to instill a little bit of fear in, uh, in Aiden. And so I said, okay, let's go up, let's hold this bird-eating spider. And it's so big, you had to use two hands, and it's crawling up your hands, getting on your arms. Aiden had no fear. I was blown away with it, so I got to step up to the plate, do the same thing. So I've held a bird-eating spider. Aiden has held a bird-eating spider. I'm still not a fan of spiders, but I can check it off the list and say I've done it. Guys, I miss you. Care about you. Hope you're doing well. Um... And uh, like I said, I'll put some info up, uh, hopefully, you know, next week, maybe around Tuesday, like I said, we'll do a little Zoom, and uh, I get to see your lovely faces. I just, I miss you. All right. Um, I love you guys. I care for you guys. I'm praying for you guys uh, every day. All right. We'll see you later.